Hi, I'm Malika Bilal. I'm Ahmed Shabuddin, and you're in the stream, now live on YouTube. Today, can Native Americans change U.S. politics? As an unprecedented number of indigenous politicians run for office, we ask why? November's midterm elections could be a pivotal moment in the United States. Not only could the balance of power in Congress shift, but the representation of Native Americans in politics could grow significantly. There are more than 100 indigenous politicians running for state or national office. So what do they hope to achieve? Here to discuss this from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Deb Haaland, a member of the Pueblo of Laguna tribe and the Democratic nominee for U.S. Congress. In Oklahoma, Joseph Blanchard, he's a member of the absentee Shawnee Native tribe and a Republican candidate for the Oklahoma State House. In Kansas, Sharice Davids, she's a Democratic candidate for U.S. Congress. She's also a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation and in Minnesota, State Representative Peggy Flanagan. She's part of the White Earth Nation of Ojibwe tribe and is a Democratic candidate for lieutenant governor. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the stream. So good to have you all here. I want to get started on my laptop with uh, this piece of video released about two months ago. It's called The Climb. Have a look. I don't look like most people in Congress. My life is different, too. I pushed through college and law school as a single mom, and I'm 30 years sober. But struggle made me fierce. My work is to fight for all of us. Clean energy jobs, Medicare for all, no more corporate money in politics. Trump won't hand us a thing if we ask politely. I'm Deb Holland, and I approve this message because the old way isn't working. We must be fierce. Are you ready? We must be fierce. Deb, you mentioned there in a pretty powerful piece of video. It is a campaign ad, of course. But you mentioned, I don't look like most people in Congress. Talk to us today about what it took for you to make it to where you are today. Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here with such a wonderful company. You know, I've been involved in politics for a long time here in Albuquerque, uh, across New Mexico, actually. I on many, many things. I was the state Native American vote director for President Obama's re-election campaign in 2012. And, and I, I ran for lieutenant governor in 2014. I was the state chairwoman of the party uh, in 2015 and, and got us, actually did really, really well in our 2016 elections. So I, I've just been on the ground for a long, long time. I'm a community organizer and uh, just felt that uh, it was time for me to, to take that uh, next step. And, and so I, here I am running for Congress after 15 years of work at folks to the polls. Mm -hmm. I, I could see our, our other guests smiling there as they saw that campaign ad play. Peggy, what were you thinking? And why is it important that your voice is heard as well? Sure. Um, well, again, thank you for having us, and I am uh, thrilled beyond belief to be uh, on this on this panel. And as I was watching uh, Deb's ad, um, I was getting a little misty because it matters uh, that we are seen and we are heard. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many Native folks are stepping up uh, to run uh, this year. Uh, you know, when when uh, folks don't see Native people, it's easy to. Uh, pass policies without working in partnership with uh, with the Native community, and and I think our time has has really come uh, for us to be at the at the forefront of policy making. And frankly, when Indian Country does well, I think the the rest of our our state does well, and our our country does well. You know, Sharice, I'm curious. Uh, there's a lot of people online trying to you know. Uh, explain why this is happening, why so many people are politically engaged within your community. For example, Opel Boyer saying, our people traditionally have been exhibiting strong leadership, although that history isn't always told, and we are resilient. We've withstood adversity, we've persevered through poverty and hate, finding ways, or have, I would imagine, f found ways to thrive. Why, why do you think this is happening? Why are you so excited? You know, I'm really excited excited because what we're seeing right now, I think, is the culmination of a lot of hard work that's been going on for a really long time. It's like it's like that person said, you know, we've been finding ways to thrive for a really long time. And I think particularly one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of 
um, Native women stepping into leadership roles and being acknowledged as leaders as the leaders in the community that Native women have been for a long time. Um, I'm really excited because what I see right now is a lot of hope, a lot of folks who are finding things that they want to vote for, not just things that they want to vote against. And I think that this is the beginning um, or the continuation of a lot of hard work that's been going on for a while. I pulled up uh, on my laptop here a headline that really corresponds to that tweet that you read out, Ahmed. Mm -hmm. This is from Indian Country Today. Native Vote 18 is the hashtag that you see online. Native, 18, uh, Native Vote 18, 100 plus and growing Native candidates seeking early votes. Joseph, when you read this headline, what thoughts go through your mind? And you see the tweets uh, that have been streaming under this headline as well, like the one uh, Ahmed read out. What do you think? Well, you know, it's important to uh, first let me acknowledge the fact that uh, being a guest on this panel, I'm honored to be here today representing my people in the state of Oklahoma. But, uh, you know, to answer your question, Native people trying to uh, participate in, in this process, you know, our, for a long time our voices have been unheard. And I, I would bet that's why uh, candidates like myself and these other ladies are all joining forces with other people within their own communities and around their state to finally let Native voices be heard. And I think that's essential. Um, you know, a lot of the work I used to do specifically for my tribe uh, primarily was as a, uh, uh, a point of contact for our people. And, you know, doing all of that, uh, you, you are able to help develop a policy and procedure. And, you know, whenever you, you're Native voices finally heard and implemented in, into those arenas, it makes a big difference. You know, I also want to ask whether maybe what's happening with the Trump presidency here in America has something to do with it and the nostalgia to Obama and the work that he had done to kind of, you know, mend relationships with certain, uh, I guess you could say, certain tribes, but also on a, on a kind of collective level. We have a tweet from H.G. Flores that says the Obama pre presidency provided hope that their voices could be heard. The election of Donald Trump showed how quickly things could change reminding Native Americans that they must rely on themselves if they want continual representation within U.S. politics. Uh, Deb, when you, when you hear that, I mean, is this, is this a reality that is, that is at play, or is it something else? No, I think we always need to step up whenever we can. You know, it's not always easy sometimes when you're a Native American running for any office because um, often, t I live in Albuquerque, but there are a lot of Native folks who live in very rural communities. It's difficult uh, to get around uh, even without public transportation and things like that. So uh, I recommend recognize challenges in our communities, uh, which is why I have chosen uh, for so long to work very hard to make sure that Native voices are heard, that we are registering uh, Native Americans and getting them out to vote, driving them to the polls, doing whatever we can to expand early voting into those communities. And um, so that's something I fought for for a long time, something a lot of folks here in New Mexico have fought for for a long time. And, and so we'll just keep uh, working hard. But Yes, if we need to be heard, so uh, I can see that uh, four of us here today are we're making sure that we can be heard, that our people's voices are heard in mainstream America. So, sure. It, it all starts at the, at the polling booth, though, I think. Sharice, I could see you nodding your head there. I want to play for our audience a little clip of what you have to offer. This is Sharice David's Fighting for Progress. Have a look. This is a tough place to be a woman. I've been put down, pushed aside, knocked out. Truth is, I've had to fight my whole life because of who I am, who I love, and where I started. But I didn't let anything get in my way. Still, it's 2018, and women, Native Americans, gay people, the unemployed and underemployed have to fight like hell just to survive. And it's clear, Trump and the Republicans in Washington don't give a damn about anyone like me or anyone that doesn't think like them. Enough. That's why I'm running for Congress. And one thing's for sure, I won't back down. Because progress is undefeated. We just need to fight for it. Are you ready? 
So, Sharice, you are running for U.S. Congress in Kansas. What is it that you will be fighting for specifically? So there are a couple of things that I think um, a lot of us and many of the people on the panel um, are, are fighting for. One is to have leader, the leadership of this country be more reflective and representative of who we are as Americans, who we are as, as people, and, you know, being Native American and being a woman, being first-generation college student. There are so many different uh, groups and people who have a diverse range of experiences, and, and our voices are not represented or reflected in our country's leadership. And I think that that certainly is something worth fighting for because that's what living in a you know in this democracy means is that we should have a, a representation and be at the table so that's one thing and then you know I would say broadly I I want us to be a country that is um, striving for these ideals that we are constantly um, trying to adopt and and live up to like equality and um, equity and I think those are the kinds of things that we as a country should be striving for. And, and in my opinion, the best way for me and my, my role in all of this is to be a voice in Congress to help make sure that our policies and our legislation reflect that. And Sharice, to your point, you know, we have a lot of people online also commenting on the lack of representation and diversity um, in elected office here in America. Jennifer May saying, personally, it seems ridiculous to have a House of Representatives that doesn't adequately represent the U.S. Native Americans were here before us and suffered brutally at the hands of our government. Uh, you know, Peggy, when you, when you see that and you hear what Sharice said, and, you know, I know you were the previous executive director of the Children's Defense Fund in Minnesota. And, you know, you look at what people are commenting about, like Opal again here saying, I think Native candidates having experienced oppression want to stand up and fight for other vulnerable communities because we do not exist in silos. What happens to one happens to all of us. Um, and you see what's happening in America today with immigration, with the children uh, that are being separated from families. And just in your experience, is it about this crossover? Is this about intersectional resistance? And what are you specifically hoping to accomplish? Absolutely. Um, and I think yesterday uh, I was at a rally um, with our immigrant community uh, talking about the fact that we need to ensure that we are keeping our families together. Uh, what we have experienced as Indian people, right, as Native folks, um, are our children being stolen from us at the, the hands of the United States government and, and put into boarding schools. That's one generation removed from my family. So it is absolutely critical that I stand shoulder to shoulder and in solidarity with the immigrant and refugee community um, because this hits so close to home uh, for all of us. I know that many of us have experienced um, just the, the trauma of, of the separation. And so when we work together, uh, when I am able to uh, stand with uh, my brothers and sisters in, in the immigrant community, uh, we know that we, we all do better. Uh, there has been a very deliberate movement um, by the Trump administration and, and frankly, uh, by the Republicans here in, in Minnesota to divide us along um, the lines of race and class and geography, uh, and I think we're not falling for it. Uh, Native folks live in the urban community, we live uh, in the rural community, and I think our experiences can truly uh, be those experiences that can bring us together. Mm -hmm. And of course, because Native Americans live in several different communities, that it also includes different political parties as well. Mm -hmm. Joseph, as we can see, not all Native candidates are Democratic candidates. Some are Republican. You are running as a Republican candidate for the Oklahoma House. I'm wondering what you think of the tweets we just heard uh, Ahmed read about intersectional resistance. What is it for you? It does, does that sum up why you're running, or, or, or what is that impetus for you? Well, actually, um, what really created the, the drive, to, the moving force behind me to consider running for office was uh, earlier this year in April, we had the uh, two-week uh, work stoppage for the teachers and education here in Oklahoma, and it, it dawned on me uh, earlier this year working in, in with my students and the coaching and doing the things that I do uh, in our discussions that there was no visibly Native person within our house. And for me and the people that I, I work with here in Seminole County, uh, just east of here where I live, that to me, that's important. That's the home of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. And, you know, with a, a student population of approximately 
uh, 50, 60 percent native student population. That, you know, to me, that is important that there was a tangible for our students to be able to relate to. And, uh, you know, in, in big scheme of things, I think that's why all these individuals are running. And, and you know, they touched on it, the, the things that our people have had to endure throughout our history. You know, those things are important. Uh, it, it's an experience that most people um, that, you know, we're not born with a silver spoon in our mouth. And we, we, we've had to strive and work so hard and, and be diligent and persevere through all the things that we've done. And so, you know, understanding those struggles gives us a whole different perspective to leading compared to our, our counterparts. And Joseph, just hearing you talk about that history and the legacy and, and how important it is, I mean, maybe it's an understatement that you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth, but a lot of people are pointing to that history, but also bringing it to the present day, you know, the Keystone Pipeline and all the controversy and concern um, amongst your community. Uh, we asked our community if the Keystone Pipeline might have been a factor. H.G. Flores saying undoubtedly it was a blunt reminder of exactly what you're talking about, their history with the U.S. government U.S. business over people, and I just wanted to get your uh, sense, um, Deb, Deb, about this video that you may have seen. AJ Plus did a, my colleagues over there did a did a little video of basically a member of an Arizona tribe uh, filming a U.S. Border Patrol vehicle heading towards him and running him over. Uh, you know, obviously his tribe uh, opposes Trump's uh, policies on the on the border and. And so I'm curious, when you see these kind of videos, you hear what you know, Joseph said, what comes to mind? What is the solution? And, and how might you actually work to, to, to find that? Yeah, that is, you know, those videos, the, the ones of the kids being ripped from their mother's arms, those are all just incredibly disturbing and makes you uh, stop for a second to wonder what happened to our country because that isn't the America that so many of us were raised in or that our parents were raised in. And as he mentioned earlier, yes, Native Americans have had an, a horrible oppressive history, uh, which is why we can relate to so many other groups, people in this country. And uh, so, yes, those are things that people should be outraged about. We should, we should stand up for that man that got run over. We should question ICE. We should defund them until they have, um, you know, a, a policies that are set that don't um, oppress people, that, that, are, that are actually humane. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't ignore things like that, and it's up to us to, to raise the red flags and, and make sure that those are part of the conversation. We, there's too much emphasis putting on all of the, the really silly things that, uh, you know, come into mainstream media like, you know, porn and things like that when we, we should be talking about, right. um, you know, these kids and, and right. this man. And, and you know, many, and many people are talking about it and they're also talking about, you know, what else is at play here in the community, uh, you know, the kind of remote and marginalized nature of um, reservations, Lakota man saying, what we natives want is for our government to simply honor the treaties, also help bring more job opportunities to the reservation. We are looking for a hand up, not a hand out. Maintain and honor tribal sovereignty. Uh, address the myriad of social issues natives face on and off the reservation. Uh, Peggy, you know, when you see a tweet like that and you see people talking about how disconnected these reservations are, Adam on Twitter saying, we need to reconnect the reservations with the rest of society. At the moment, most part natives are uh, compartmentalized and out of sight. Is that like too big a challenge to actually overcome? It's been out of sight and out of mind for so long, uh, you know, living here in America, just anecdotally. Well, if I thought so, I wouldn't be running for office. Um, and I think the rest of us wouldn't be either. Listen, um, I, I think the, the, the tweet that we saw before, too, just saying we're simply asking the government to honor the treaties and to respect tribal sovereignty. Um, you know, I serve in the, the Minnesota House. Uh, there are four Native women who serve in the House. We have our Native caucus. And so often, um, you know, we've been used to policy being done to us um, and not with us. And I think our caucus has worked to change that. Um, and part of the reason why I'm running for lieutenant governor is to ensure um, that, that Native people, uh, that Native women, um, you know, I find that um, because... Uh, because we are not always visible, uh, at best, 
Native women are invisible, and at worst, uh, we are disposable um, when it comes to issues of violence against Native women, um, missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, so when I think about uh, running for the seat or I look at you know, my sisters uh, and my brother on this panel, that's why it matters, so that um, Native folks, uh, my, I have a five-year-old daughter, Siobhan, so she can see uh, these other leaders who are stepping up, um, but that also uh, folks simply say like, oh yeah, absolutely, treaties are the supreme law of the land. Um, treaty rights are not these special rights that we've been given. We've always had them. And we believe in a government-to-government -government relationship and meaningful and deep consultation. And that should simply be uh, you know, the, the place that we start from. And I think that we will see the, the changes come to Indian country once our leaders uh, respect us and also uh, reflect who we are um, and the policies that we're trying to move. And I can, can see, I? Sharice, I can see you nodding there. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I would um, love to just follow up on that point for a second. And, um, you know, when you think about the idea that uh, not just Native voices, but many voices in this country um, have been uh, either invisible or haven't been heard, I think a lot of, of um, a lot of the reason that you see so many people running for office now, I myself, myself in particular, you know, I think that one of the one of the places where our government has failed us um, as people, not just Native people, but a a lot of groups of people is that we have people in decision-making positions who are not listening. So um, not only have these voices of Native people, of women, of um, Black folks who have been fighting for liberation for a long time, those voices have always been there and they've always been fighting. And what we need to do is fill decision-making positions and leadership positions with people who are willing to listen and people who are willing to take action to make sure that voices are being elevated and voices are being listened to because those voices have have always been there. And, and it's so important that you say those voices have always been there. We have a tweet from Chuck Hoskin saying um, on Twitter, it's both a natural progression of our politics after decades of work by other Native activists and a response to concerns about alarming policies and budget priorities coming out of D.C. Again, you know, uh, a kind of a hat tip to all the people who have endured and thrived, uh, to use a word that's been used. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's worth kind of sharing this video that also came in where uh, Mark Trahant really sums up what is uh, actually happening here and what this moment means. Take, take a look at this. First, there's been a buildup of capacity. More and more Native Americans uh, every year have seen others take that route and have been successful. And so they're following up and um, adding more to the equation. The second reason is the success of um, Legislation, particularly at the state level, you're seeing states where like Montana has Indian education for all, and people see that being a strong policy uh, that works for everybody. And so that's a reason for people to run for the legislature. A third reason is uh, probably unique to this time, and that's particularly women running because of opposition to President Trump's policies. As one candidate told me, they really expected to have the first woman president and instead they're having policies that they feel are hostile to women. And you, you know, that's something that keeps coming up and up, uh, you know, across different communities, quite frankly, Muslim Americans, different communities here, that women, I mean, it's not surprising <laughs> that we have three women here on this panel, perhaps, <laughs> the majority, <laughs> the year of the woman, perhaps. And of course, Joseph Blanchard. So I will let all of our audience know, for those who are in the states, when they can vote. June 26th, Republican primary uh, for Joseph. We've got August 14th primary for Peggy, Sharice in the August 7th primary, and Deb Hallen at the November ballot, because you've won your primary. Yay. So such a pleasure to have you all here. I want to end with this tweet from Chuck, uh, echoing something. He tweeted a little earlier, and this is a follow-up. He says, Native Americans should get registered, stay on top of relevant issues, vote, and get involved in campaigns where possible. Push for funding of federal trust responsibilities, include health care, education, housing, protection of sacred sites, just to name a few. So some uh, directions there from Chuck. I want to thank all of our guests because we have to pause the conversation there. Thank you for being part of today's show. And of course, thank you to our community as well. We'll continue to follow this story at hashtag AJStream. We'll see you online.